everybody. Well, welcome, yeah. everybody. Thank you so much for coming on this beautiful summer day. Um, and welcome to our viewers online as well. My name is Janet Fleischman. I'm a senior associate here at the CSIS Global Health Policy Center. And we are delighted to have guests and speakers here today. And I think you have their bios uh, on the sheet that was outside, but I will do a brief introduction. I also want to say a few words of thanks, first of all, to Katie Peck from the Global Health Policy Center for all her help in organizing this event, and also to Mona Bourmet from the Christian Connections for International Health, um, who have collaborated with us on this event and who have been responsible for bringing our guests here for their annual conference, which is taking place this week. So thank you to CCIH as well. Uh, we are quite honored to have these two speakers from Kenya joining us. Um, we organized a similar event last year with, uh, and I believe one of our speakers from last year is here today. Is Tony here? There he is. Ooh. Welcome. This is Dr. Tony Tumasigwe from the Ugandan Protestant Medical Bureau. Thank you for joining us, Tony. Uh, and we're very eager to continue this discussion about the role of faith-based organizations in advancing access to voluntary family planning, information, and services, as well as to learn about new efforts at mobilizing greater interfaith advocacy for family planning. Today we'll be looking specifically at Kenya, where faith-based organizations have been active for a long time in providing health services, as well as focusing in on maternal child health services, and part of that being family planning. The Christian Health Association of Kenya has over oh, close to 600 health facilities and programs. And if you put all the faith-based organizations together in Kenya, there's over 1,100 health facilities and 27 medical training colleges in the countries. And faith-based organizations provide some 30% of the total health services in Kenya. And in certain counties, it's even higher. So clearly, the role that's played by faith-based organizations in providing health services is, is extremely important. And the importance also of faith-based organizations in providing information and access to family planning is also important for them to meet their own health goals and also to meet the needs of the women and girls in their communities. This is also a very interesting moment in Kenya. Uh, with a lot of important opportunities and some very big challenges. And we know today that the uh, Kenyan government has initiated a process of decentralization that they call devolution. We'll be hearing more about that, but it's really shifting the health services from the national level to the 47 counties. And that presents also new challenges that we'll be hearing about from our speakers. Uh, we also want to hear more about how the religious leaders are engaging in maternal and family, maternal health and family planning in their communities, how they're partnering with the Kenyan government, what support they're getting from other development partners, including USAID and other US-based donors, like philanthropic organizations, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the David and Lucille Packard Foundation. There's a lot of interesting connections on uh, funding from the U.S. that we want to hear more about that focuses on these issues of family planning. So let me introduce our speakers because we have lots we want to discuss and then we want to open it up to questions from all of you because I know you'll have plenty that you'll want to hear about as well. Uh, so first we have Dr. Samuel Mwenda, who is a medical doctor specialized in health systems management. He has served for the last 13 years as the General Secretary and CEO of the Christian Health Association of Kenya, called CHAC, which is a national network of Protestant churches, health facilities, and programs all over the country. In this position, he's responsible for the strategic leadership of CHAC, secretariat, partnership building, resource mobilization, and advocacy. He is also a member of the Health Sector Coordinating Committee and the Vice Chair of the Kenyan CCM, the Country Coordinating Mechanism, for the Global Fund. And to my left is Peter Munene. He is a social worker by training and the International Program Coordinator for the Faith to Action Network. Peter has 18 years of experience in advocacy and implementation of programs 
specifically tar targeting marginalized groups with a focus on economic empowerment and protection of rights, including combating child labor. From late 2005 to 2012, Peter worked for DSW in Tanzania and then later as the uh, um, advocacy, uh, in charge of advocacy for Africa and Asia. And in 2013, he assumed the coordination of the Faith to Action Network, which is a global interfaith network in support of family health and well being. So we thank you both very much for being here. Um, and to begin with, let's just start out hearing a little bit more about your organizations and the work you do on family planning. Samuel, do you want to kick us off? Uh, thank you very much. The Christian Health Association of Kenya was started way back in 1946. It's a national network of uh, hospitals, health centers, dispensaries, community-based health care programs that are owned, operated, or supported by uh, various Protestant churches uh, in Kenya. Uh, we are involved in health service delivery uh, at those uh, different levels. We follow the guidelines that are laid down, policy guidelines by the Minister of Health, uh, and we, we are regularly engaged with the ministry in matters of policy, matters of uh, guidelines, regulation, and in programs. So our services are comprehensive. Um, we target, you know, we, we have services for, for children, for, for women, for young, for, for adolescents, for adults. Uh, very specifically, we run maternal and child health services, which includes antenatal services, delivery services, postnatal services, but also uh, uh, family planning. Uh, the Protestant churches have no um, health facilities, do embrace uh, the entire range of family planning options and, and methods. So we provide counseling. Uh, we help um, uh, women and men make choices on the methods that uh, are appropriate for them. And we provide those services as appropriate. Thank you very much. We have lots more we want to hear about that. But um, Peter, do you want to tell us a little bit more about your work on family planning? Yeah. Um, let me just introduce the Faith to Action Network by uh, letting everyone know that Faith to Action Network is a global interfaith network. It's a network that promotes health, and uh, especially the issue of uh, family planning and reproductive health, which in our own language we call family health and well-being. It was started in 2010. Uh, the efforts to start this particular network started in 2010, but formally or uh, the blessings for, for the network were given in 2011. And uh, we are now uh, an established network, a legal entity, uh, with a head office, if I were to put it that way, in Kenya. But our members are across the, the continents. Our current board is also spread. It's, it's based on organizations. CCIH is a founder organization of the network. We have other organizations that are in Europe and in Africa and Asia. What, what we do specifically on issues of family planning is uh, the building the capacity of religious leaders on issues of family planning. Uh, so that they become better advocates, champions of family planning. We also do a lot of advocacy, advocacy both internal within the faith and also external focusing on uh, governments and focusing on, on donors and other agencies so that they become more inclusive in terms of uh, participation of the faith community in policy and decision making that relate to family planning and reproductive health. Internally, we, we try to get more faith acceptance, more faith acceptance, more faith leader support for uh, uh, family planning and reproductive health. So basically, that is a faith to action network. Uh, and can, just to interrupt for a second, can you clarify 
which faiths are involved in the network? Uh, we have uh, Muslims, we have uh, Christians, and uh, Christians, we have Catholic, we have uh, Protestants, we have Hindu, we have uh, Buddhists. And uh, within Christians, as I've, as I've said, we have uh, the Catholic, we have the, 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 the Protestants, we have the traditional or the African instituted churches, especially in Africa. Those are the independent, we call them independent churches. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about why faith-based organizations like CHAC should be involved in family planning. Why does it matter for the broader set of goals of your organization and the health needs of your community? From a health perspective, uh, because we, we are a health-oriented organization and we work with health uh, facilities, we know there are major health benefits for the, uh, helping couples and, and uh, women have you know, the right timing of their pregnancies, the appropriate number, uh, uh, the right uh, spacing. Uh, sometimes we know there are those who may have health issues that uh, would best benefit from a, you know, um, a, a particular uh, uh, limit in terms of uh, pregnancy that they can have. But also, as we, because of we value family health, uh, the well-being of the family as a religious uh, organization. Um, and you know, the family well-being, the parents, the children that come into families, depend also on the ability of the parents to take care of their, of their children. Give them good nutrition, give them good health care, ensure they receive all their immunizations on time, give them good education, and help them to build a foundation in life. Um, I think this, this, this creates a, a very strong justification for, uh, uh, you know, for, the, for, for the churches to get involved in promoting uh, family, family health, family well-being, and family planning being a critical intervention. What are some of the complications um, that you have, some of the challenges you have in bringing uh, religious leaders into the discussion about family planning? Within health facilities, is no problem because the health workers understand um, the value and the importance of family planning. I think when engaging religious leaders, uh, one of the challenges that they are, they are training and their backgrounds Many, most often d does not, has not given them opportunity to learn about uh, the role of family planning in, in, in promoting good health. So there's a capacity gap. And uh, we tend to have a lot of expectation on religious leaders, assuming that uh, you know, they, are, they, they are knowledgeable on everything, and expecting that they'll, they'll give correct advice in an appropriate way and give the message in a sensitive way. So one of the challenges I see is uh, uh, the need to help them acquire the right knowledge, the right information, <coughs> and be able to have uh, you know, the best uh, you know, uh, communication uh, tools to be able to pass on the message to the diverse uh, the communities that they, they serve. And from your perspective in the work you've been doing with the Interfaith Network, what, what, did they, what did they bring to the table? When you can get the religious leaders involved in some of these issues of family planning, what benefit does that bring to the communities that you are active in? I think, uh, one, we have to appreciate and realize the power religious leaders have the leverage they have when it comes to people that they serve, the congregations that they serve. They are with them uh, nearly on a, on, a, on, a, on a daily basis. And they have even specific days that, 
if it is uh, on a Friday, if it is on a Sunday, that they meet with them, and they meet with them voluntarily. Now, harnessing that power and uh, leveraging on that opportunity is what we look at when we are looking at how they can serve the people in giving them information that is helpful in, for, 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 for their own well-being. What we have seen is that, uh, as Daktari has mentioned, Daktari is doctor, I'm now using Swahili, <laughs> uh, is that uh, the moment a religious leader gets the right information and the right tools that they can use to communicate to their congregation and pass the right information, they are really very powerful in terms of uh, mobilizing uh, people to support, mobilizing, creating demand for services, making people aware of the services that exist and where they can get those services. The challenge that there is is that uh, uh, with, with the religious leaders, they are also coming from different backgrounds. Uh, they have different levels of knowledge, different levels of education. They are also coming from different belief uh, foundations. And uh, those belief foundations also carry with them certain positions when it comes to the issues of family planning. Now, the, 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 the importance of bringing different religious leaders together is that they share from different faiths. They share what has worked in their own context, how they have approached certain problems or certain difficulties, where they have had successes. And uh, that sharing helps the different uh, religious leaders to be able to, to replicate and occasionally even to take those, those uh, practices, those, those uh, examples that have worked well, best practices that have been seen to work, and uh, replicate them and even scale, scale them up for their own uh, uh, congregations. And I think that is the beauty. The, 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 other, the other thing is that once they come together, at the point of sharing, and they are from different faiths, it becomes like a melting point. The, the, the issues of uh, the, the restrictions each of them would have in their own faith, at that particular point is lost, they are discussing the issues. And uh, what they leave that particular meeting with or that particular gathering with is the skills on how to handle those issues that they are facing in a different way. We were talking about some of the lessons of HIV and the engagement of the religious <coughs> leaders and certainly the religious um, health community in the fight against HIV and the potential to bring some of those lessons to advancing access to family planning. Samuel, do you want to talk for a minute about what you see as the lessons in engaging the faith leaders on HIV and how that might translate to family planning? Yes. When uh, um, HIV pandemic hit Africa, and uh, I think we were all struggling about how to package the message about uh, prevention and you know what are the causes of HIV sp you know spread and uh, how that those could be mitigated. Uh, I think the, the religious communities faced challenges because. Uh, the way they understood and perceived and, and uh, uh, went about communicating the message uh, ended up being very insensitive to people who within their congregations or their audiences were actually sitting there and they, have, they were living with the virus. So stigma was a very major challenge. And uh, so for, for, for some time we saw uh, faith communities and religious leaders as, as a barrier, as a problem. But what we realized, uh, actually our weakness was that we are not empowering them. We were not helping educate them, uh, get them to realize um, the best way of communicating and uh, how we are all affected by HIV. They turned around and became you know, very critical champions. And because, uh, because uh, 
Religious leaders and places of worship are all over, in all communities, in urban areas, in slums, in the rural areas. Uh, we, they became um, very effective sources of support in terms of uh, passing messages, but also encouraging uh, people to get, come out for testing, but even offering spaces for services uh, within the, uh, the, the premises of, of the places of worship. So what I see is just recognizing we, we need capacity building. The other realization was that uh, religious leaders are different levels of education, of exposure, of knowledge, and they couldn't, cannot all be handled the same. So taking time to not only expose them to one training or one, one or two, but have a process of engaging them, continue to empower them, provide them with tools and IEC materials, information they can use uh, to pass messages to appropriate groups, uh, age groups, uh, people of different gender, and so on. So I see this time around in family planning, uh, there are great lessons we can learn about uh, how we can engage religious leaders and faith communities um, in a, in a sustained way, in a continuous way, so that they are, they are effective, they become advocates, they become channels of passing the right information. Um, and also look at how they have been able to manage passing information to different age groups uh, in their own space. Because sometimes one of the challenges that we have in churches, in mosques, is that you have a, a very uh, mixed group. We have our children there at different ages. We have the, their parents. We have their grandparents. And it's not sometimes a good space to pass you know, certain messages, particularly in the African context. But when uh, we have groups, women's group, men's group, youth, there's a much better space to engage with them very deeply uh, at their level and in a way that uh, a message uh, can reach them well, and they, they are able to open up and, 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 and engage with us. And Peter, do you think that there are lessons for the uh, family planning communities based on the experience of HIV? There are a lot of uh, lessons. Uh, when you look at uh, the role that faith leaders have, uh, and religious leaders have played, in, in, in dealing with the stigma. Because initially they were considered to be even uh, sources of stigma. But the, the, the way they have been able to turn around with the right information, with the right skills, uh, and, and be able to, to be the, the sources of protection for those who are positive has, is, is something that can be used very easily to support the issue of family planning. Uh, family planning and, uh, and, uh, and uh, HIV AIDS, to me, actually, are reproductive health issues. And the, the only difference that came in is uh, because of the, the need to respond to this particular uh, issue that emerged at some point, which is HIV AIDS and the resources that were in it that tended to separate the, the issues. But with, with, with the coming in of integration, the, these two issues can be dealt with in, in a relatively easy way. And religious uh, leaders are very, very powerful when it comes to the way they can handle some of these issues. I, I want to, to give examples. We, 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 we did training in, in Addis Ababa uh, in 2013 for religious leaders on the issues of sexual reproductive health as, as it relates to young people, the needs of sexual reproductive health of young people. And uh, out of that training, uh, we were training religious leaders and uh, uh, other also representatives from faith organizations. Out of that training, we've seen a lot of changes with, with some of the religious leaders that were present in the actions they have taken in their own congregations in their back home when they, were, they, they have gone back home, on the way they are, they are, they are handling issues of sexual reproductive health in terms of uh, passing no, the right knowledge, creating opportunities for those who have the skills and those who provide services
to come in and interact with young people and provide those services and provide the knowledge and provide the education that is empowering in terms of providing them with uh, life skills on how they can manage these issues. So the issue is not so much that the religious leaders would be resistant, because they are also dealing with these issues at uh, congregation level. They are dealing with uh, teenage pregnancy. They are dealing with early, early, early marriages. They are dealing with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, issues of even abortion, because they, they are not they are not immune to these issues. They are, they, are, they are part of the community. The issue is once they are given the skills on how they can handle some of these issues, which some of the, some, where, where some of those issues have not been trained in theological schools, then they are able to, to address them. And I, actually, they appreciate that they have gotten additional skills on how they can manage the community. Because they are managing people in a holistic way. They are not. Uh, managing only uh, the spiritual, they are also managing the social, the economic, and, and all other complications that come out with, uh, and, and issues that people are facing. So they are very, very hopeful. Yeah. Well, I think just picking up on this, this issue of integration is a very important one, of course, as a service provider. Um, but it also links in with the, uh, some of the challenges and uh, complications of, of resources. As Peter was saying, sometimes it's different funding streams and different um, complications in bringing these services together. Can you describe for us from the CHAC perspective, how do you promote integration and how important is integration for the women that you serve? Integration makes it... Uh uh, easier to access a package of services. I think for a while now we've had um, the whole package of maternal and child health services put together under one roof. <coughs> so you have, we have clinics that are called MCH, maternal and child health. Sometimes they put stroke family planning because that's part of uh, maternal health. But they provide uh, services for antenatal uh, mothers who require natal clinic services. They provide uh, postnatal care services. They provide family planning, uh, counseling and services, and also immunizations for children and growth monitoring. So that is a very successful area of uh, integration. Now the other opportunity for integration is the whole area of HIV uh, management, particularly because preventing mother to child transmission is a part of the package that, that is now routinely provided in antenatal care services. So an area I think that we can strengthen integration is to, uh, is to make sure that uh, family planning information uh, and, and counseling services are also provided within our comprehensive care clinics which provide HIV services and then uh, empower the maternal and child health clinics to do HIV testing, uh, counseling and testing for the antenatal mothers who require PMCT services. So they don't have to be referred across to another building or another health facility to get that uh, particular service. As we do this, uh, because there's been a bit of resourcing uh, for HIV services, including uh, mobilization at community level, we can actually leverage uh, those opportunities to also include family planning messaging for the outreach services, for community health workers who are doing HIV work uh, to provide information as well about family planning. Do faith-based organizations have a particular role to play in that community, uh, community mobilization? Can you speak a little bit, either of you, about uh, the importance of faith-based uh, networks in communities to pass these health messages, including about family planning? I can try. Uh, we have a number of experiences. We have a couple of projects um, that uh, go beyond the facility. And that's because of the realization that uh, sometimes we have services, but the demand is not there. Because uh, the knowledge about the service or the knowledge about when one needs to seek the service, um, 
may be limited in the communities. So um, two approaches we use. One is to, to recruit, train, empower, and send out community health workers who are volunteers uh, that live within the community. And uh, they know where the people live in the villages, and they can be able to reach them, reach out to them with information about, it, about the service. <coughs> Another strategic uh, opportunity that we have as uh, uh, fifth um, religious uh, institution is that we have uh, the religious leaders and the places of worship, so the churches uh, that we, we reach out to, provide them the training, the, the orientation, or the, or the service that we have, and um, try to use the structures that already exist, meetings that already exist, which always tend, there will always be some gathering of people at least once a week, or several, several groups in a week. And those creates opportunities for passing public health messages, um, which includes giving them information where they can find the actual service. And family planning would be one of those. The reason being, when people are sick and hurting, they will look for a place where they can be helped because they are sick, and that's why the hospitals are there. But for a, uh, a promotion service uh, like this, sometimes if people don't have information and uh, they are not well uh, informed how it helps in the long run, they may not come out to seek for service. They may not even know what options they are available and where they are. So reaching out, uh, it's, it's a very critical component of helping people come uh, to get the appropriate service. There's also the, the whole piece of policy in Kenya that's evolving. And perhaps you can speak a little bit, uh, Peter, about the work in advocating with the Kenyan government and describe a little bit about your relationship with uh, different structures in the Kenyan government to try to encourage support for family planning? I, I think uh, when it comes to uh, working with governments, there, there are many, many opportunities that exist for the faith uh, communities, uh, religious leaders to be engaged in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in decision making and policy making. Uh, I think Dr. Mwenda Viruchak uh, is participating already in a number of uh, uh, government um, policy making, policy making uh, processes, technical work, through technical working groups, being part of uh, technical working groups. Uh, he has uh, mentioned, that, for example, that he is, uh, he is um, 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 the, the vice chair uh, of the, the CCM, Country Coordinating Mechanism for a Global Fund. But we also have situations where religious leaders themselves, uh, depending on the issue of health that is, uh, uh, that is a st stake, engage with the government, they engage with the leadership, whether at ministry level or even sometimes uh, seeking the political will of if it's the president or the, the deputy vice president or the governors that, that because we have now devolved, devolved systems in Kenya, or the governors, or uh, the, 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 the wives of the governors, sometimes because those are the easier ones to, to use to, en to, to engage the governors or to get the support of the governors. So there, there, are, there are different levels of involvement. It just depends with the, the issue. But I want to mention that uh, uh, a lot of issues that where we have had communities not fully understanding, understanding the, the health implications, the health benefits of a service, whether it is vaccination, whether it is family planning, whether it is on HIV AIDS. Uh, when, when that message has gone through uh, religious leaders and uh, religious uh, uh, institutions that exist, whether it is churches or mosques, or temples, because they always pass this information to the congregation. The congregation has been very easily mobilized. It's very easily mobilized through religious leaders because of the space they have and, uh, and, 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 and uh, the, the voluntary nature of people coming. 
because I, I, am, I am an Anglican. I, I, I see, and I, I'm also a church elder. And every, every Sunday we have announcements. And the announcements that we have are both internal and external. Any, any announcement that is coming from the government, if it's the Minister of Education, if it's the Minister of Health, and they want to pass a specific message, it comes, they, they pass it through the, 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 the church. And it is announced as part of the, the announcement that will be made and people are encouraged to make sure that they, they participate. If it is, a, for example, a free medical camp, or uh, they're they announcing that there will be vaccinations, and they, they, they are always encouraging people, depending on the message that is there. So it's very easy for family planning, equally, um, to pass on these messages and, uh, uh, through, through the, the existing infrastructure, because this infrastructure exists and it's uh, free. It's free to use, except now when it comes to technical, the technical knowledge uh, that would be maybe creating confusion, confusion or, or bringing issues of mis misperception, that is where we are talking about capacity building yeah. and empowerment. Maybe I could comment on devolution mm -hmm. uh, and how it affects health in Kenya. In 2010, we adopted a completely new constitution, which uh, introduced a new governance uh, system, which has uh, a national government and 47 county governments. And each of these county governments has a structure, which is at the top, we have a governor who is elected by other people and his deputy. We have uh, an assembly and we have an executive, which takes care of various services. Um, in, uh, in the constitution, it was specifically written that health will be totally devolved, which has separated roles. The Minister of Health at national level is only now responsible for policy and regulation uh, and training of health workers. And there are a few, just two, three uh, national referral uh, hospitals. The rest of service delivery is the responsibility of the county government department for health. The implication has been that um, the counties are now responsible for identifying their own priorities uh, in health, um, doing plans and budgets, and allocating, uh, determining what budget they allocate for various uh, health interventions. What this has now um, uh, brought about is the need to uh, be able to help the counties appreciate the health burden in their, in their counties and, and um, you know, how to use the evidence to prioritize interventions. And uh, clearly looking at um, the health indicators, including family planning, the unmet need, the coverage, uh, the total fertility rates, there are a lot of differences across the 47 counties. There are counties which are doing very well, the accountants are doing very poor. In fact, um, in the very recent past, we've had um, that mapping done. And because there are 15 counties which are having uh, very poor maternal indicators, there has been uh, an effort to get the to top leadership, get to commit uh, to prioritize interventions for maternal and child health. So through the support of UNFPA and, and the Minister of Health, these were brought together. The, the information was presented to them, the facts about the situation. And um, the governors felt the challenge that they needed to include maternal and child health um, as, as top priorities in their own counties, to allocate more resources, uh, to you know, encourage more partners to come and work with them uh, in order to try and improve uh, those indicators. And it would be interesting, I was going to get exactly to that um, new effort in Kenya to engage the county leadership, but also coming from the, the president, the first lady, um, raising these issues of the importance of maternal child health. How much is this a new reality in Kenya? How important is this 
in Kenya? And how much is family planning being included in this broader discussion uh, on, the, on a high level uh, platform about maternal child health? Uh, certainly, we are at an exciting moment. Um, uh, in Kenya, we have a first lady who has uh, decided she would dedicate her energy in creating a lot of awareness, mobilizing support and resources to address maternal and child health challenges. So she has launched uh, what, she, what is called Beyond Zero campaign. And it's basically um, targeting to address the causes of maternal mortality and uh, infant mortality and childhood mortality, as well as uh, prevention of HIV transmission from uh, mother to child. Um, she has used her position uh, you know, to try and encourage uh, government to allocate more resources. In fact, uh, the president announced free maternity services for mothers needing to deliver in public institutions. The government has allocated resources for that. But she's also raising funds, creating awareness by running marathon. She has done it in Kenya a few times, uh, three times now. And what is uh, very exciting is, is just how people come out and the, how it receives a lot of publicity and, uh, and which, which receives a lot of media debate and prioritization. She has also recruited the spouses of governors who, and you know, governors are leading their own counties and have, have all the responsibility for their people to be a part of that effort. So I would say there is, is, it's a time of, you know, we have very good political will and uh, a, a lot of momentum led by the first lady. She did it the first year, we thought she would stop there, but she, has actu she, has, she actually has, has a plan. It's called uh, a framework for engagement in, in maternal health, child health, and HIV prevention, and it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's a, it's a three-year plan. And she is continuing this year. Uh, the money she raises, she's been equipping clinics, procuring cl mobile clinics, and equipping them to be able to provide even delivery services out there in the villages for those uh, mothers who are, cannot be able to come to facilities. Is there a family planning component to that? Yes, family planning is one of, among the components is to address barriers uh, to accessing uh, delivery services, but also promoting family planning as a critical uh, intervention for promoting uh, maternal health. Interestingly, uh, the same, uh, after the governors uh, came together and also made a, a community where they committed to support maternal and child health, uh, there, there has also been a national effort to bring together the religious leaders from different um, religions uh, to support, uh, for support of maternal and child health. Again, uh, that effort was led by uh, the Ministry of Health, UNFPA, together with the Interreligious Council of Kenya, and uh, a number of other, other agencies. World Vision was involved, and uh, a number of other, other CHAC it was involved, Faith Action Network was involved, and a number of other faiths equally were, uh, and, and networks were involved. And uh, through this particular co conference, the, the, the religious leaders themselves committed to supporting maternal and child health. And maternal and child health, including family planning, uh, were, were the, the aspects that were being discussed. And they have come up with, a, with equally um, a commitment on how they would want to go about it. The, 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 the issue is that uh, with, with some of these commitments, which are political, gaining that political goodwill, there, there needs now to be the, the follow-up support for the services that they require, which is what we have seen when we have trained religious leaders and they become real champions promoting family planning, promoting uh, sexual reproductive health, within their communities and the need for, for, for people to go for services. Sometimes the services are not uh, as quick to come. And those that provide services are also not uh, readily available, sometimes because of resource constraints. So that's, that's the, the, the gap, I think, that currently exists in uh, creating demand. You create demand and people come out 
uh, to seek services, but maybe the services themselves are not readily available. So I think the, the matching of uh, the creation of demand and the availability of services is one area that needs to be worked on. But the good thing is that at least you have them creating demand, which, which is uh, the, 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 the initial challenge. Uh, the, the, the challenge of now matching the demand and services becomes another one to, to, to address in a different way. Well, and that's a huge issue with devolution because now the counties have to be procuring the commodities and uh, looking after their health systems in a totally different way. Can you speak to any concerns or at least challenges that they will face in ensuring that the family planning programs have the resources, the budgets, the commodities that they need, including the full range of family planning uh, contraceptive commodities? Yes, uh, it's, it's certainly going to be a challenge because these counties don't have enough uh, resources to meet all their health needs. Um, we have the ma many communicable diseases. We now have a huge growing burden of non-communicable diseases and we have maternal and child health services that require uh, commodities. So as we go, as we are going to counties, and counties have uh, their own set of priorities in terms, in terms of challenges they see every day, people dying every day because of various disease conditions. Uh, I think it will be, we need advocacy for, for, for the different elements to be put on the priority list. Um, we also need to help with support where, where, where we can in terms of uh, additional resources that are dedicated to certain services. Because even when national level has been procuring, they have been having quite a lot of support uh, of these commodities supported by partners. Um, German government has been supporting quite a lot. Uh, USAID has been supporting and a few other partners. Uh, so. Um, I know there are discussions going on that some of the public health commod uh, commodities should actually be managed at national level uh, so that we can coordinate whatever support that is coming from uh, some partners and also put in the government investment in them so that uh, we look at the total you know, national needs. But uh, even beyond uh, commodities, we need health workers. We need... Um, you know, community outreaches, uh, you know, need education and so on. So I would see the need for us engaging uh, the county uh, health management uh, teams to ensure that uh, these needs are actually being prioritized in the competing resources that they have. And is this a message, especially in the advocacy realm, that your organization is, is putting out there? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, there, there is one appreciation that we, we need to have about counties. One, uh, that the devolution is a very new uh, concept in terms of the, and, and, and also reality in, in, in Kenya at the moment. They are only now uh, three, years. three years old. And uh, some of these counties that have been, uh, when they were created, they were created um, f starting from ground zero. And, and, and the challenges that are emerging now that people themselves are identifying their own issues and they have government that has come closer to them. They have people that they can question that, have, that are closer to them because they have uh, MCAs, what we call uh, the, the <laughs> The, the member of county the, assemblies. Yeah, member of county assemblies who are closer to them. It becomes a totally different issue because the issues that are emerging from the communities are, are nearly at grassroots level and they have readers at grassroots level who are responding to these issues. So the, the competition really in terms of priorities is very high. And uh, some of these, uh, the counties are also you know when you create entities, they, they assume a personality in a way. Uh, they, want to comp they want to be like, like maybe Waji wants to be like Nairobi. Uh, Garissa wants to be like Mombasa. But Mombasa 
uh, when it was created as a county, has found certain, certain uh, infrastructure already existing. It's not the same case with, uh, with Garissa, it's not the same, same case with Isioro, Masabit. So they are, starting, they are starting at different levels, but they want to catch up very quickly. So to catch up very quickly means they are trying to do their level best to, to be able to match the other peers in terms of counties. So that, that in itself, when you are now doing advocacy for the issue of family planning, you need to, to do that advocacy and possibly even link those counties with where they can get some of the additional resources. Because this requires additional resources for them to be able to prioritize it and put it on the, on the, on the, on the, on the agenda of issues that they, they are dealing with. Because they are dealing with very, very, uh, a lot of public opinion and pressure from the public on the public wanting to be, to be like the other, the other counties. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a challenge, but it's also a challenge in terms of advocacy. Because this, this type of advocacy and the need for the linking of advocacy with resources has not been the advocacy that we are used to. Uh, so the, the, we, we are doing advocacy that requires us also to, to, be, to, to wear the shoes of the, the, the governors, to wear the shoes of the county when you are looking at the county and where it is and in terms of its priorities so that you can find out where would, be, where would the resources for this come from. Uh, so that when you are doing advocacy, you are saying you can also link to this kind of resources to be able to, to provide for family planning and deep productive health. So I have many more questions, but I know there's going to be many questions here, so I'm going to have to limit my questions. But I'd like to pull this back to two questions. One, given all these challenges, where does the faith community come in? And where does the importance of a voice for faith medical groups in this discussion. And linked to that, where does the faith community contribute to these discussions about Kenya moving toward more sustainable family planning programs? Are there, are there ways that the faith community is particularly involved in or could play an important role, both in the advocacy for the resources that the counties are dealing with, but also uh, in looking ahead to find ways to make these programs more sustainable, more durable for the long term? Maybe uh, to, to start, and uh, Dr. Terry will join, the, 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 the issue is uh, the already existing infrastructure that the faith has in terms of already existing uh, facilities. What, what, has, what is emerging is occasionally uh, in most of the counties, they are equally establishing nearly parallel uh, infrastructure uh, in terms of uh, health facilities. So there is uh, the need for advocacy to say, look, uh, you need to do mapping to see where, where already there exists this sort of infrastructure so, th so that you don't take resources to do the same thing to establish an, uh, an, uh, a facility that already exists in, 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 this, in this area. And, and, and then the other element of advocacy is to see how these facilities can, can work uh, in synergy. How the, 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 instead of the, the county establishing a health facility when there is already an existing faith-led facility, how this particular faith-led facility can be empowered, can be uh, expanded, so that it can provide for also the needs of the, the expanded now clientele. That, that is a, a lot of advocacy that, that is required. And uh, it's also advocacy for the faith-led facilities so that they can now be more accommodating uh, instead of uh, only focusing on, on maybe the targets that they are, the beneficiaries that they, they, they were established to look at. So it's, it's, there, there is quite a bit of advocacy uh, in looking at existing resources and how those resources can be used for the, for the betterment of, of the, the Raja community so that there is no duplication and uh, establishing existing infrastructure instead of 
expanding whatever is available. I see um, the evidence that has been provided in terms of um, where we are at with our maternal uh, indicators, because that's one area that we've not moved very, very well towards the Millennium Development Goals, and I know it will continue being a key priority, even as a country. And the fact that this evidence now is being provided also disaggregated per county, uh, that should create the urgency and uh, the need to really look at uh, how we prioritize. Number two for me is to ensure that uh, these services are included in our, in our strategic health, strategic plans, uh, maternal health, strategic plans and action plans at national level, but also at every county level, because every county has its own um, health strategic plan, but also uh, annual action plans against which uh, you know, they seek budgetary allocations. The third thing for me, I think we need to um, target to empower our faith network to do advocacy at different levels. This data is appropriate. We need the data we can do at national level, but just like the government is devolved, we need to empower uh, religious leaders at the other levels uh, to be able to appreciate the need, to appreciate the problem, to appreciate uh, the prioritization that is needed, and uh, empower them how they can engage to help uh, keep this as a priority. For the faith-based service delivery network. The good thing, we are all over the country in various counties. So for us, we shall continue providing services. Our only appeal is support for capacity building, for access to, for strengthening of our systems, but also for access to the commodities that are actually required to provide uh, the entire mix of family planning services. Well, that leads to what I'll call my final question for now, um, in terms of the US. Here you are in Washington. You were on the Hill this morning. Uh, it would be very interesting to hear your thoughts on, well, what was your message to the uh, congressional offices that you visited? And what are the changes that you see in terms of US assistance uh, that may affect your health services? I think for me, the, uh, my, the, op the opportunity was, this was an opportunity for us to, uh, you know, to say thank you uh, for so much. Actually, it's happening uh, in our countries, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, because of the very good relationship that we have, the good partnership, and the support in many ways. Uh, some of that comes direct to our government. Some come through international NGOs. Some of that comes through the agencies, to those of us who are providing services. Uh, through USAID, CDC, WaterAid, um, and the others. So we are very grateful for that support. And uh, our appeal is that uh, the investment in global health um, is, 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 is very important. It is helping um, transform lives. It's helping save lives of, of children, of, of uh, uh, young people, of adults. And um, it's making a great difference. And uh, it's one of the great things the U.S. has known about out there is uh, the involvement in life-saving, life, uh, you know, uh, transforming uh, initiatives like HIV treatment and now reproductive health, child health, and so on. <coughs> you know, how the uh, appeal is that this continues, and this continues to grow. We know there will always be you know, shifts and, and you know, adjustments in, in policy and prioritization. Um, but uh, just also asking that uh, sometimes opportunities are given for input from the ground. Uh, because some of the realities we are discussing about the disparities between counties, sometimes we can assume a country has moved. The indicators have, have, have shifted. Uh, but the reality may be that uh, there may be pockets which actually need um, more investments, uh, new innovations, and this is where we are you know, 
appealing for continued partnerships, um, both technical but also uh, financial support where that's possible or through commodities and so on, for us to address and help improve um, indicators across the entire population. And uh, for me, the other message was a health sector in, in Africa is not complete if you don't include public, faith-based, and private. Because sometimes we see initiatives that only target government. For Kenya, government only provides 50% of the health services. If you only work with government, you missed half the population. But if you combine public, faith-based, and private sector, you provide uh, you have covered over 95% of the population, or close to the entire 100%. So one of my appeal is always consider this even as we conceptualize what kind of programs, what kind of interventions, which kind of partners we can work with uh, on the ground. Well, I think that's a, a good way to end at least our initial discussion and maybe time to open it up for, for your input in the audience. What we'll do is take about three questions at a time. Please wait for the microphone to come around so the people listening uh, online can hear. And please identify yourself and keep a question, a question, fairly short. Uh, and why don't we start in the back? Wait for the mic, thank you. Hi, very interesting. I'm from Susan Newcomer from the National Institutes of Health. I would like to ask your guests how they connect with the apostolic and evangelical so-called owner-operated churches in Kenya, of which I understand there are a fair number, and which seem to encourage very early marriage and lots of children. Thank you. And we had another question just in the row ahead of you, I think. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you can just share a story, because um, I think a lot of times when you're trying to make a case, you know, this, a story from the ground can really help. Just a story on how um, a particular family planning initiative was not taking off until a faith community got involved, just to hear about the impact. One more question up here. Hi, I'm Shelley McGuire. I work for Population Reference Bureau. My question is related to male involvement in family planning, uh, service delivery, uptake, education programs, and whether from your perspectives and your roles you've seen any particular um, effective methods used by faith leaders in engaging men in order to increase support for FP. Thank you. So a good first round of questions. Um, first, the issue of some of the evangelical churches and early marriage. Then the on-the-ground story of family planning successes linked to the faith-based uh, involvement. And then, uh, again, the male involvement um, through the faith community. So why don't we take those three for starters? Samuel, want to start out? Uh, yes. The first question, I'm, I'm actually not, I've actually not come across uh, evangelical churches that uh, encourage early marriages uh, in Kenya. Uh, what I know is that uh, we tend to have a lot of this from traditional practices, yes. cultures, uh, and, 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 and probably more cultures from the Islamic side. Um, and some of our traditional African culture. <laughs> so actually churches come in to encourage, to try and uh, um, encourage parents not to, you know, to send their, their daughters to school and not to um, send them off into marriage early. And sometimes create uh, safe spaces, uh, like within some of the pastoralist communities. Where, where girls, where, where the young girls can actu are actually taken in and uh, kept and helped to access education. If there are churches, we would, would uh, de definitely want to um, use our religious leaders network to engage their leadership. Mm -hmm. Because uh, this, is, this is even, government does not encourage this. Uh, because it not only affects health, 
and having many uh, children, but also you know, girls miss opportunities to have education and uh, you know have the best uh, the, you know of opportunities in life. So why don't we let uh, Peter come in on that question as well in terms of the harmful traditional practices and and early marriage in particular and the work that you're doing. I think uh, the issue of early marriage, I, I've, I haven't come across the evangelical churches. What I've come across is the uh, African Institute and churches. Uh, the African Institute and churches, which we call independent churches, um, have this, th this component is a bit mixed because they, they also, um, they also have a lot of traditions, African traditions uh, and practices mixed together with the, with the brief, with the brief, uh, the Christianity briefs. And therefore, sometimes it's difficult to, to separate or to draw the boundary between what is really cultural and what is uh, really religious in, in the way they, 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 they practice. But it's not all of them, it's some of them. Now, uh, what has happened is uh, that there is now more opening in terms of dialogue with those uh, African student churches. They are being uh, mobilized to become members of, uh, uh, we, because we have a, a national body which we call the Organization of African Institute and Churches, where because of that dialogue, once they become members of that particular uh, organization, then uh, they engage now on certain standards certain standards in terms of uh, liturgy, in terms of practice, and among the issues that are dealt with and addressed include issues of early marriage. Now, with the, with, the, with, the, with the Muslim community, again, there are a lot of uh, uh, some, sometimes scriptural uh, misinterpretation. And, and these are not uh, gen general, gen general. They sometimes are very specific to, to certain, to certain uh, regions and certain areas. So what, what we have done at the moment uh, is through the support of the, the Dutch government, uh, Dutch Minister of Foreign Affairs, and also support that is coming from uh, Population Action International, um, we are, we are organizing what we are calling a caravan. And this particular caravan we are organizing together with uh, uh, an, uh, a university in, in, in Egypt, Al Azhar University. It is uh, one of the oldest universities in the Muslim country, or Muslim world. It's over a thousand years, and it, it is really considered an authority on uh, issues of uh, uh, theology when it comes to uh, Islamic theology. And, in, in, uh, and authority even in, t in terms of uh, the, the directives that come from it. It was one of the, the first institutions, uh, Muslim institutions, to come up with a fatwa on family planning, in support of family planning. So we are organizing a caravan this July, end of July, in four counties at the coast, Mombasa, Kware, Kirifi, and uh, Ramu where we'll have some experts come from, uh, from Arazal, and they will, together with the, with the Muslim leaders in, at the coast, and even some Christian leaders, they will, they will go through communities trying to clarify, clarifying misperceptions about early marriage, uh, about family planning, about reproductive health, use of uh, commodities of uh, method, different methods of family planning because they, they, they are already considered as an authority and therefore that's, that's one of the linkages that we want to make to help clarify some of those issues uh, and, and address issues that are, have been persistent in that area, especially on early marriage uh, among others. Yes. So maybe each of you could take one of the next questions. One was about the engagement of faith leaders in uh, sort of an on-the-ground story of success in family planning linked to the faith engagement, and the, and the other was about um, faith engagement with uh, male involvement. So each of you take maybe one you of can try. Uh, let, me, let me attend the male enga engagement. Our um, family planning uh, programs 
we are trying to uh, encourage male involvement. In fact, some of our community health workers are actually uh, males. And we found that where we successfully managed to recruit uh, males to be, uh, to be empowered uh, with the education, with the training, with the, uh, the, the, the tools and resources, and involve them in communicating with their spouses, but with their peers, uh, the uptake of family planning services is actually increasing. Um, there are methods that uh, health workers would encourage to get uh, the spouses come along, uh, where they are, if, if they can be willing, particularly the long-term or permanent methods. It, it, you have better confidence when you know, the, the couple uh, agree to it together. Um, however, in, in rural areas, sometimes it's very difficult to encourage, uh, to get, uh, you know, the women get their spouses to come along. But as we are, uh, the kind of uh, sensitization that we are doing through the training, we are really encouraging that men get involved. And one way that we found effective is also have them as the community health workers who are trained and they are going out uh, to pass messages so that, because it's much easier for them also to reach uh, the men. Maybe you can attempt the other. Do you, do you want to talk maybe about an, uh, a success in family planning that's linked to uh, the involvement of faith community? Yeah, I, I think, uh, well, let me talk about how we have, for example, engaged the traditional churches. We have, uh, we have, in this year, engaged with the, with the traditional churches in Kenya by having, um, organ together with the Organization of African Citizen Churches, a meeting of all bishops of the African Institution Churches in Kenya, and a meeting of all the secretary generals of uh, some of the, the, the churches, or the executive, depending on, on the term that they use whether it's the executive or the secretary general of most of those churches. And uh, the, 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 the issue has been to discuss with them on family planning and discuss with them on, on, on how they can pass those messages. First, uh, the acceptance of the message, and secondly, how they can pass the messages to their, their congregations. What we have seen is that uh, a number of of, of them have taken up those issues very very quickly because there were already issues that they were being they were, which were challenging to them uh, at at local level and they are they are they are moving on with uh, creating awareness um, shifting the mentality of uh, their congregation in terms of support for family planning because we have what what we witnessed is that in uh, in a lot of their congregations women were having very many children, and uh, the spacing was very, <laughs> was very short. With, like, it was nearly on a, on a year basis, you'd have a, a family which, which has children that are like, you know, stair, staircases, you know? <laughs> they, they are, the way they follow each other is, uh, is quite, <laughs> yeah. So they, they, are, they are taking up that challenge. They are, I want to recognize, for example, the African Brotherhood Church. They are, they are really doing a, a wonderful job uh, in, uh, in, in Machakos and in other areas uh, in Eastern Province. I want to, 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 to recognize also the, the African Independent Church of, of, Afri of Kenya. It, it's doing wonderful. We, we've seen a lot of changes in the way they are now engaging their congregations uh, with messages, and uh, of course, we, we do not know whether the congregation is picking up the message, but at least the leadership is engaging the, 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 the congregation. And we believe because it's coming from their own leadership, uh, people are going to be positive about the message. So there are, there are good examples that are taking place. And we have also seen the same thing because uh, being a network, we also have uh, members in Uganda, some that we have trained, we have very good examples of some bishops from Anglican Church, some reverends from the Anglican Church, who have not only engaged their communities in Uganda, their congregations in Uganda, but also 
started creating spaces, uh, youth-friendly services in their own churches, and uh, we, we have different examples of, of such uh, leaders. We, we have Bishop Kazimba in Uganda. He's wonderful. Yeah. OK, let's take another round of questions. We'll start over here in the blue shirt. Karibu. Thank you. Asante, Asante. sana. I was privileged to um, work four years in Kenya on family planning, starting Please identify in yourself. 83, pardon? Please identify yourself. Gary Merritt, USAID, X, you say. Um, this was a time when you all were just barely born, I think. But uh, <laughs> I remember it vividly. Uh, years, uh, the following years, Kenya's fertility declined at the most rapid rate that had been recorded uh, ever uh, at the national level, up until around the mid-90s, at which time it uh, plateaued. There is even some evidence it declined, uh, that the prevalence of use of family planning declined, and there were consequent uh, slight rises in fertility. I understand that. Uh, unfortunate trend, which was the first time it had been recorded in any country where prevalence of use of family planning went up and then actually declined. There have been several instances since. My question, of course, is leading to, in looking at the long arc of family planning history in Kenya, is there anything about that period that you associate the period of leveling off and actually declining family planning? that is associated with changes in religious environment or religious leadership or um, can you characterize how you feel faith-based uh, delivery and leadership and uh, promotion is uh, affecting these broad trends in Kenyan family planning history? Thank you. Why don't you hand the mic right next to you? Yeah. Hi. My name is Naveed Khuram from Kunni Christian Hospitals in Pakistan. I would like to know about uh, health workforce production by the CHAC. How many medical schools come under the umbrella of CHAC, and are they fulfilling their health workforce needs? Thank you. And I think we had one more over here. Yes, my name is Russell King. Um, I understand that Human Life International has recently done work um, in Kenya, and I, I believe they've advised the Kenyan legislature not to liberalize their anti-abortion laws. And um, so my question is basically, how do you make sure that your family planning policy is consist bioethically uh, correct as well as consistent with Kenyan law? Okay, let's... We're going to just take those three questions and see if we have time for, for one more. Um, so we have the question of the leveling off and potentially declining of the CPR and whether or not that had anything to do with the religious environment. Does either of you want to take that one first? I would think, uh, having been in the field uh, of, of that, 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 that period, I think the major difference was uh, the investment in programs at the community level. We used to have very intense, widespread programs of community-based distribution of family planning that were well-resourced. We had community health workers that were trained, that were equipped, that even um, uh, Pro they provided information and referred, but also provided some methods uh, like pills and condoms. Um, the health facilities were also uh, getting regular training. There were many projects, well funded, so there was, you know, opportunities for continuous mentorship, uh, training, but also resourcing in terms of some of the facilities that are required to provide services. There was also a lot of support for outreach services. I worked, the hospital where I worked, we had teams every other day. So there were, we had, we were able to reach out to many, many people within where they live, 
uh, with information, with services, and that actually was uh, enabling us to reach very many people who needed services. I think with the advent of HIV, you know, we got you know, you know, competing priorities. And uh, once it was declared a disaster, and yes, indeed, it was having major impact on the, on the health and lives of people, we found both gov our national government as well as a lot of donors shifting their priority in terms of investment uh, to that area. So for me, I would think it was not about the religious uh, leaders' engagement. Uh, I think it, it, it just the, the shift in prioritization and the loss of investment at community level. I think also the workforce question was directed to you as well. Uh, yeah, we, we, the faith based in Kenya have, um, uh, we have two universities training doctors. We have uh, another three hospitals that have residency postgraduate specialization programs. But we have 27 middle level colleges that train nurses, uh, clinic officers, and uh, two that are training laboratory and pharmaceutical technologists. So we contribute. We are all regulated by the, uh, the regulatory bodies. So the, those that are trained through these programs they, they are registered to serve anywhere in the country and even, even outside. And do you want to take the final question about the family planning and Kenyan law? I'll start with uh, maybe just making a small contribution to the first question uh, about family planning. When I was growing up, it's true, as you're saying, when I was growing up, uh, those 1990s, there was a, a major national campaign uh, in support of family planning. Uh, I, uh, as as you, you are talking, I, I could recall some songs that we used to sing, which were on national radio every, every single day and uh, would sing about that uh, if a mother wants to, 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 to regain health, they sh should actually space for three years. There, there used to be a song uh, that space give, give for, for the husband, give the mother three years so that they, they, she can regain health, and after, after three years, she can actually think about another baby. It was a national, uh, a song that was uh, done by a, a, a national band, and uh, it used to, to sing, and everybody used to pick. That was the, the level of messaging that was there in support of family planning. Equally, as I grew up, um, <laughs> I could see the ladies in green. They were the ones who were providing uh, community health workers. They used to provide uh, family planning products, uh, especially uh, uh, pills, condoms. And I, I, I remember seeing, uh, let me say women, go to them whenever they were, they, they, they were without the pills and, and get surprised. And they used actually to, to go visit homes uh, because they used to come also at home. <laughs> And, and I would see them. Then, of course, as, as uh, Dactaria said, the moment HIV AIDS came, <laughs> things just turned upside down a bit. Uh, uh, because there was a lot of sh resource shift from HIV, including from the personnel that was uh, managing uh, maternal and child health, family planning. Most of them were retrained now to provide HIV uh, related services. Now, with, the, with the, the issue of the Kenyan law um, and, and, and abortion, if I had you correctly, uh, for, for the faith community, the issue of abortion is, 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 is totally different. It's not supported by the faith community. Uh, the, what is in the Kenyan law is, is, is very different from what is in the practice when it comes to uh, the level of uh, acceptance of that particular uh, provision within, within the law by the, the faith community. Uh, so I, 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 I don't think the fact that it is, it is different is a contravention as such. I would, I would consider it to be an issue of engagement in terms of what does it mean? Because I think there hasn't been a lot of uh, consensus building 
between what the, the Roe says and what the, 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 the faith community believes. So I, the, that, that remains a, a gray area. And then, Doctor, you, you want to? I think maybe what we can do, uh, we have Dr. Tony here. I just wonder if he wants to make any final comments from the floor, given um, his perspective and coming from Uganda. Just want to give you a chance to say something, if you'd like. There's a mic for you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, just to say that uh, in our context in Africa, uh, Uganda, Kenya, there's a lot of dialogue that needs to be done to harmonize a number of things, uh, especially learning from each other in terms of what is happening in Kenya within the faith uh, network, and also what we are doing. Um, I think there is a need to harmonize a number of things, and. Uh, Faith to action brings that, that, that component that will bring all of us together uh, so that uh, we don't see each other as people who are conflicting on the issue of family planning, for example, but uh, being communities that are complementing each other. Uh, one of the things that I think is critical uh, is to understand that some of the faith would favor certain methods and not others but not look at that as a way of conflicting, but uh, ensuring that everybody uh, is able to practice uh, what they feel and they're supported uh, to practice what they feel uh, is critical. Uh, because at the end of the day, we are all able to ensure that all our families are, are having a healthy lives. For those that support maybe natural family planning, we should ensure that are those commodities, specifically for natural family planning, are on the table, and that a woman who goes to any facility uh, is able to get the whole range, but then choose which services they think uh, is best for them, but also providing for the faith that they are coming from. I think to me that is critical. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. So unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time. I want to give our speakers a minute to say any last concluding thoughts um, before we wrap it up. So let's begin with you, Peter. Yeah, I think uh, to me, the, 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 there is a lot of um, value and um, really added value when, when, when people are able to be brought together. That's what I've seen with the network. The moment uh, different faiths have come together it really contributes to understanding. In fact, it contributes even to peace. That's, that's what I've seen. I've seen uh, greater understanding, greater collaboration, greater partnership of even organizations that were not expecting previously to work together because of uh, coming together, gaining understanding of each other and uh, the different perspectives. The other thing is, uh, to me, to appreciate those governments and agencies that have worked and supported the faith community in, 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 in providing health services, the US government, the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, NORA and the, the Norwegian, uh, the, the UK government, they have supported, uh, and, and, and many others, uh, including UNFPA, they have really supported uh, efforts by the faith community, recognizing, of course, the diversity in terms of positions, the diversity in terms of uh, services. And I would want to really encourage others to, to, to work together with the, with the faith community. Of course, recognizing that the faith will not just shift in one day to, to become the very progressive <laughs> and uh, the supporters of uh, total comprehensive uh, uh, sexual reproductive health services, but we can work with the faith over time, uh, uh, because what what the intention is to provide services to the to the people, and the people who whether they are they are practicing natural family planning, or they are practicing all the comprehensive uh, methods of family planning, they are the same people that would want to to have services. Uh, reach to them. So we need to work with the faith, starting from where the faith is, and then progressively we can maybe move towards uh, them even deferring where they cannot provide services, certain services, to other areas where 
those people can get services. So I want to appreciate all the support that we have received from the different agencies. Samuel, last word for you. I wa just want to appreciate um, the consideration of, uh, you know, of giving opportunity for faith-based uh, faith institutions and religious leaders as key stakeholders in reproductive health. But they are a resource that can make a, a difference, help us you know, to get the next mile. My recommendation is that just like when public health, we develop uh, projects and initiatives for health workers, we begin with a baseline. Where are we at in terms of capacity, in terms of resources? You know, what capacity building needs to be done? And as after we do capacity building, we don't leave them there. We follow the map to see how are they doing? Where do they need to be strengthened? So we have mentorship. We have monitoring and evaluation. We have a process of continuous engagement. And then we monitor, we have indicators, we keep tracking how we are doing. I think we need to think about a process like that in uh, engaging and empowering religious leaders. Because they are all not at the same level, they don't have the same level of understanding of, or, or speed of learning. Um, so when we understand where they are at as we begin to engage with them, as we have a program of empowerment, let's also have a, 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 a system and process of following them up to continue helping them, to continue uh, you know, addressing some of the issues they encounter when they go out to help us in promoting uh, family planning, education, and, and mobilization. Uh, let's also appreciate them uh, when, when they do well in, in, uh, in, in making us progress. And where we can identify those who are, uh, who are very you know, uh, effective, you know, can they be champions? Can they be mentors? Can they be role models? And have a way of um, um, uh, you know, using them to help others. Uh, to progress. So there is opportunity for me, and um, what we need is a, is a process of investing in, in cap building their capacity, but also supporting them to deliver. Thank you. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion. I know that we could have gone on for much longer, but I so appreciate you taking the time to come here to share your views with us and to engage with this audience. And I want to thank the audience for such an interesting uh, discussion. And please join me in thanking our speakers. <laughs>